morning. I am Mary Haft, and I am so happy to welcome you and so happy to look out at all of your faces. This is our seventh annual book festival, and we are here because of all of you. And we have an incredible team of people who dedicate their time and talent to make this festival possible. We all work really hard, and we really try to keep this free and open to the public. So every single person that makes a contribution is helping keep this alive. Please do look at the back of your programs, because there's a lot of people who have made these contributions. But we have special thanks to our premier sponsors, The White Elephant, and of course, right here, the Nantucket Athenaeum, our most historical, extraordinary institution. We also want to thank the Inquirer and Mirror and Magazine, WCAI, Nantucket Hotel, Fairwinds Counseling, and the NHA. So we are, and all our sponsors and donors. So we thank you all so very much. Um, Katharina Vermette will be signing books right back there following our presentation. We also owe a debt of gratitude to our incredibly generous supporter, visionary founder and CEO of Canada's largest book retailer, Indigo Books, who brought Katharina to our festival and who champions the power of the written and spoken word. So to Heather Reisman, we are giving a big shout out. Katharina Vermette brings her poet's voice to paint a portrait of a community generations deep an indigenous Canadian community threaded with pain, with loneliness, with abuse, with crime, generations linked with love and the ties that bind. There is love and healing in the cracks. As Leonard Cohen wrote, that's how the light gets in. There is a singular voice that calls to us from the beyond, a voice that reminds us that love is the unquenchable, unconquerable, force of life. A Canada Reads 2017 finalist and a Heather Indigo Books pick, it is a privilege and an honor to welcome author Katharina Vermet. Hello. Oh, I feel tall. Thank you all for coming this morning. I want to uh, first start by thanking my hosts. This is a beautiful, uh, everyone involved in the book festival has been delightful. Thank you, Mary, for that introduction. I love that quote by Leonard Cohen, our dearly departed real poet laureate of Canada. Um, we've had such a great time here. We got. Um, I also want to thank the Nantucket Hotel. They've, they've done amazing things, especially the gift shop lady. If you ever go in there, the gift shop lady, I don't know her name, she's wonderful. She helped me pick out my new scarf. <laughs> All day yesterday we were wandering around and you, you guys, your scarf game is strong. <laughs> and I wanted, I didn't have one to compete, so now, now, I, now I can go out with my head held high. Um, I always start when I come to a place uh, to acknowledge the traditional keepers of the land. Uh, this is something that is a traditional practice among Indigenous nations. When we're going to a new nation, we must acknowledge the traditional caretakers. Um, and it's always devastating to me, um, and devastation being a very mild word, um, when those people are no longer with us. Uh, so I want to thank Peter Brace and Jane Alexander, who are on my in my van yesterday, um, who were, were telling me some stories about uh, Wampanoag, Wampanoag, um, which is also a name for this island as well. One of the names, meaning far out place. So um, I really want to acknowledge them, the Wampan Wampanoag, uh, who, uh, whose language is Algonquin language, very similar to one of my languages, with the, which is Anishinaabe Moan. So just think of that language group separately um, from all the way from here, stretches all the way out to where I am from, which is Winnipeg, just north of the Dakotas. So that's how big that language group is and how much those people moved around and um, affected their space. And still do, sorry. <laughs> because though, unfortunately, the Wampatanoag are no longer with us, hopefully, and hopefully some of their traditions and stories have been kept. Uh, where I come from, uh, we're still around, um, which I am, you know, forever amazed at the resiliency of, of my people. Um, 
So the, the next part of a traditional welcome is I tell you where I'm from. Um, and, and part of it is my bio and part of it also is, is my tradition. I come from Winnipeg, Manitoba, which is in Canada, the exact center of the continent, if not the universe, just, just kidding. Um, and we're just north of the North Dakotas. It's, uh, my place is a junction of rivers um, and we are grateful for those rivers for sustaining the land in such abundance for so many years. My people are the Métis Nation. We are one of those post-contact nations that happened after contact. So we have a blending of a lot of uh, Scottish and Irish and, and uh, French tradition along with Cree and Anishinaabe. Um, my languages are Anishinaabe and Michif. So today, I, well, I'll, I should, and I should have started at the beginning, I will greet you in that lang those languages. Buju, Anin, Tansikia. I am ever grateful to be here. So to know a bit about where I'm from is to know a bit about me. Um, I am from very much that center place. Whenever I come to anywhere near an ocean, I find it amazing that there is oceans in the world. Whenever there's a ferry, I'm like, I'm in. I just think boats are, <laughs> boats are neat. We have a very landlocked space, even though we have rivers um, that are unfortunately polluted, as many rivers are on this continent. Um, but we are very much in a land space. Um, we have, in Canada, um, one of the largest indigenous populations um, per capita with, with people. Um, in, in the world, and particularly in Manitoba and in Winnipeg, we have um, it roughly around as a quarter of the population and growing is indigenous people. So it is uh, a very powerful force in a lot of ways, and it's also a very, we're, we're still a very marginalized per people. So that is really where my work comes from. It comes from this abundant tradition of knowledge, of story, of ceremony, which I am blessed to have had most of my life. It comes from language, um, and it also comes from the endangerment of those things. It comes from you know, having to fight and to keep them strong, and also having to, to fight to um, spread them to the next generation. So my daughters have always grown up in ceremony. My daughters have always grown up with language. I didn't have that privilege. My father definitely didn't have that privilege. So it's that, that regrouping and such strength. But it's also the legacies of, of these systems of racism that are designed to do what they do. And we have a lot of risks and high risks and points of, of health and of, of success and a comment on me that we're still working through, working toward the success. So we do have, uh, as Mary pointed out, we do have lots of crime statistics, lots of, you know, bad, poor health statistics, poor, you know, there, there's a lot of those issues that we are getting through. So where I wanted to situate my work was in that place of acknowledging that reality and showing that to people because I think people need to see how other people live and those how they, but I also think that when you talk about marginalized communities, my responsibility is also showing the strength of that. So that we're not exploiting these, these sob stories. We're showing that this happens and it's heartbreaking, again, a very mild word, but also that we're working and we work through every day. Um, I was also told that I wasn't, I, I don't know how, many, how much reading do you want to hear, how much, it's so hard to say. Um, one of the, the tragedies we have in Canada, and, it, and it's also present here in the States, though I know in, in the States and, and anything, all the, the marginalization of Indigenous people is also happening in, in the States, and, and many of you might know more than I do about these statistics, because I'm not, I don't travel down here very often but uh, the population is just smaller. But one of the tragedies we have in Canada is we have thousands upon thousands of Indigenous women have been murdered and missing, or, and or missing, without knowledge of how they were lost. Um, it's a story that we hear over and over again. Right now we have a national inquiry that is uh, trying to find the answers to why this is happening. Um, and many women are also missing here in. And it's the effect of marginalization, it's the effect of at-risk lifestyles, and all, it's also the effect of just seeming to 
it's the effect of people not always caring. So when someone goes missing, they are not looked for. So that's kind of where this book kind of started. I wanted to talk about women. I wanted to talk about a beautiful family of women who had had tragedy and had had heartbreak, but also were surviving and were, were very, they're, they're just kick-ass. They're just kick-ass women that are, that are doing, living their lives. I also wanted to talk about the loss and what, how, how it feels when someone is lost. So that's where I'll start. I'll start with the loss. So this first section, you don't need to know anything. It's the first um, meant voice of Cheryl, who is one of the characters. Um, there's many different characters in this book, and this is the first you hear of Cheryl, so there's no introduction needed. Cheryl is trying to revive an old series of paintings. Wolf women, she calls them. Photographs embossed in acrylic paint. Shapeshifter portraits. She started the series years ago, and that first set was all of her sister, Rain. All the faces and wolves she could have been. Now Cheryl's trying to paint some other strong women she knows. She has done one for each of her girls, Louisa and Paulina, both small, beautiful wolves, each looking just like her, their mother, but in a different way. Sometime in the rye last night, she started a new painting of her sister. She looked at every photo she had, but none seemed right. She finally settled on a really old one from about 74, when Cheryl first met her ex, Joe. In the picture, Rain is barely 16, and she is sitting on Joe's old midnight blue challenger. Taller and more shapely than her older sister, Rain wears a brown beaded headband and fringe jacket. Her long legs and bell-bottom jeans and the red boots that Cheryl borrowed whenever Rain let her. Rain's full hair curled around her young face, which had not a line, not a worry. The sisters had the same soft mouth, but Rain had al was always more beautiful. Cheryl taped the photo on the canvas right in the middle and started sketching around it, but nothing felt right. She couldn't keep a stroke. And in the morning, it just looked gross. The canvas was still blank around the girl in the car, only pencil etchings rubbed away, scratched lines denting the white smudges, looming like gray clouds. Her sister looked alone. Cheryl wishes she had a picture of her sister dancing. That's what she needs. Rain was never so alive as when she was moving. She loved to sway around, but somehow in that whole life she had had, no one had taken a picture of her dancing. Last night, Cheryl dreamed the dream of birch trees, skinny and white against the snow and the wolves howling on the horizon. She was snowshoeing like she did when they lived out in the bush. Her city girl legs loved every bit of it. She loved it so much that years later and only in dreams, her legs still knew every tension and every turn. She could smell the snow and the winter cold air. When she lived in the bush, her sister Rain would visit, and together they would leave the girls with Joe to make forts and have snowball fights so the sisters could go off for hours snowshoeing. They both took to it immediately. Joe taught them how to strap on the shoes tight, pound through with high knees and hold the poles firmly. With mittened waves and scarf-covered faces, they were out among the birches and the wind. Cheryl loved the way the shoes made her bounce over the snow. She sank in, but not all the way. After she had had her girl, she felt so heavy, like her little body was full of stones, graceless and clumsy. But when she put those shoes on, she could amble through the trees that stretched out on the north side of their little plywood house. She thought she was the lightest she could ever be. She would put on those big feet and feel smaller. They wouldn't talk much, her and her sister. Only breathe and look. There wasn't another sound for miles only the nets on their feet hitting the snow and sometimes the wolves far off across the street, trees. Cheryl loved it. She loved the dream too, every time she dreamt it. And when she woke up cold and alone with the window open, for a moment she couldn't register where she was, this home she had had for years. 
For that moment, she only knew the empty ache beside her, the deep void where her sister was supposed to be. This book is told in multiple points of view, um, multi-perspective, poly-perspective. There's actually a really fancy literary term for that, which Tommy Orange, if you need to, another book to read, Tommy Orange, they're there. He's a Arapero, I probably didn't say that word right, and Cherokee writer out of Oakland. Um, and he told me the big fancy word, but I forgot it and didn't write it down. Um, so there's a big fancy word for what I did that I didn't even know about. Um, but I love multiple point of view novels. I love to see that something happening from different points of view. Um, and there are many things in this book I wanted to write about legacies of trauma. Well, want is the wrong word, um, kind of compelled. Um, I wanted to write about strength and that, that resiliency and that uh, the beauty of ceremony. But I do um, kind of centralize um, and circle the book around an, a very violent incident which happens to two of the characters in the book. And uh, the whole writing of the book was a process of trying to understand that, um, that incident. Um, I remember, and, and the whole crux of the book kind of happened about 10 years ago when there was a lot of news um, in the news about violence, um, uh, particularly about gang violence um, and intra-community violence, which happens in marginalized communities because the oppressed do not have the novelty of not having being affected by that. So everything kind of trickles down so into communities. And I remember thinking when we're hurting ourselves and we're hurting each other, that's when colonization, patriarchy, all of these big evil systems that look like, um, that's when they win, when we start hurting each other. Particularly when as women, we start hurting each other. That, because that feels very acute. Because we don't, we're women, right? We're not supposed to, we're supposed to be gentle and nurturing and mothering and um, not everyone who has been nurtured or mothered can, can extend that kindness. So there is violence. And um, having grown up in a very similar neighborhood, a very um, a, a inner city neighborhood, I always knew girls had the capacity of violence. Um, but as a, as a young mother kind of revisiting that idea, it feel, and as a young mother to daughters, it, it feels um, particularly difficult with that thinking that women can hurt women. Um, and they do, and they always, and it happens. And also, um, people are victims or victimized. But beyond being victims and victimized, they are people. And what often happens in these cases when we hear about these statistics that happen in places that we do not know, um, we forget about that humanity of people. When I talk about these um, indi social, in like these these social issues, like murdered and missing women, like like violence and and, get, and inner city communities, these are stats that kind of roll over. Um, but I think it's important to remember that these are people, and I guess that that's where I wanted to go. I wanted to talk about these women as people, and I wanted to bring them all up as characters, which is why we all have multiple point, we have this multiple point of view, whatever the fancy name is, of a novel, because I just wanted to bring as much different characters as I could. So that was Cheryl, whose sister Rain was a, was a victim of violence, and this is um, her daughter Stella talking about the same woman Rain. Um, and I read this because it's, as you can imagine, it's a bit of a downer of a book. Um, <laughs> but I do, I come from a bunch of really hilariously funny people. As much as, you know, my grandmother was the kind of grandmother who would, who would tell you like these crazy sob stories and then like make some gross joke about my grandfather. <laughs> That's the kind of people I come from. So I wanted to make sure to jam in as much humor as I could while talking about, you know, the legacies of trauma, which is not funny. 
So that's why I like to read this passage. So this is, so that was, so this is Rain's daughter, Stella, talking about her mom. Her mother was so many things. She was beautiful and she loved to dance. She was smart and really, really quick-witted and mouthy. That's what everyone said. Boy, that Rain has got a mouth on her. Stella always knew that, but she knew more too. Her mother was also very, very funny. No one could make Stella laugh like her mom could. Her Kukum, grandmother, too, was also smiling at Rain. Even when Cuckoo tried to be mad, Rain could always make her smile. Rain did things like make bedtime stories better. She would do voices and change the endings. She and Stella would lie side by side with the cartoon picture book between them. Stella's pretty lady lamp turned on with a good idea. The, the light bulb under her parasol. Sleeping Beauty was their favorite. Maleficent scared Stella and gave her all those bottom of the stomach flutters, but she still wanted to look. Rain would give the horn queen a funny voice and would end all the stories in a different way each time. And then they lived happily ever after because Sleeping Beauty told the prince to bug off because she had a good home in the bush and wanted to raise dogs and live a peaceful life. She didn't want no stinking, itchy gowns and girdles. Have you ever worn a girdle, she asked the prince. He shook his head because he was really very dumb and didn't have an original thought in his pretty little head. Well, she scoffed, <laughs> they ain't no fun. And then Sleeping Beauty shook her finger in his face and turned to her fairy aunties and said, come on girls, we're out of here. And out they went walking all the way back to their little house. It was a long way, but they didn't care because you can only breathe right in the bush and all those days in the palace. And after all those days in the palace, they were so happy to be home. The end. <laughs> but didn't you want to get married, Mama? Stella said, knowing, that even, knowing even then they were always supposed to get married in the end. Nah, I mean, she dated a few, you know, woodcutters, but she never seemed to find the right fella. Wasn't she lonely? Well, why would she be lonely? She had her aunties and a bunch of dogs. What kind of dogs? The kind that are, look like wolves. Big ones, gray ones, and a black one too, and she called him king because he was better than a stinking boring prince. <laughs> Stella always laughed. Sometimes Sleeping Beauty got married and she had a smart little daughter or a sister and nieces and they all lived together in a big house, but after every time, Sleeping Beauty was happy, always happily ever after. I totally didn't check the time, so I don't know where I'm going with the time here. Questions, that's right. Okay. That's great. I love it. I love being on time. I hate being over. <laughs> this is not my, you know, I'm a typical writer. This is not my place of comfort when everyone's staring at me, you know? I, it's funny, I chose to be a writer because I was a super shy kid. Um, and th what's that quote? Um, a writer is a person who wants to have a conversation with you but doesn't want to make eye contact. <laughs> um, that is me. <laughs> And I have this distinct memory of being in a creative writing class in, when I was 16 and my teacher telling me, you have to share, you have to you know, share your work with people. I'm like, no I don't, I just have to give it to someone and they print it up and I don't have to look at people. And she's like, no, you have to sh share. So I actually, I avoided it for about 10 years, getting up in front of people and uh, sharing my work. You it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's practice, it's all practice. I'll, read, I'll end with one, just as we're going on this journey of Rain. And this is Rain's own voice. Now, Rain has departed um, and no longer with us, but um, because this is a circle, and it's a family circle, and we kind of introduce different people in the family, um, I wanted to include Rain. So Rain becomes my, in this sense, a Sky Woman. Um, sky Woman is a, is a, is a Mohawk El, or Iroquoian, kind of legend figure who kind of sees all. She basically, she was really curious about people and fell to earth. 
Um, but in indigenous literature, we often have what we call a sky woman, which is like this omnipresent narrator that sees everything. Very handy when you're a writer, writing a complicated multi-point of view story, to have someone overseeing everything and you know, filling in the blanks. Um, so this is Rain's voice talking to Stella now, um, and uh, just kind of in her, own, in her own words, I feel, as we end. My girl, I have been waiting. I think I have been waiting so long I don't even know what I'm waiting for. I think I'll know it when it comes. It'll be one of those things you just know, those deep breath kind of feelings when everything just makes sense. It's a frustrating way to describe something, I know, but I don't know any other way. You can't grab spirit like that. You have to just let it be. When you were born, it was like that, a deep breath. Before you came, I was so messed up and didn't even think I wanted you. I watched your auntie with little Louisa and thought I couldn't do all those things. Not me. My hands didn't know how to wrap a little baby so tight in a blanket or tell when a bottle was warm. My heart had no room for all the space you would need. I didn't think I could do it. But when you came, I only had to look at you, and I knew. There wasn't even a feeling, or maybe just not a word big enough for all that feeling. There was so much more, it filled me all the way up. More than knowing, more than whatever else I was, I loved you and you knew it. Your kukum knew it too, and you all loved me back. Whatever else you think or know, that is the most important thing about me, that I loved and was loved. And I love questions, just so you know. Um, it makes me think I didn't bore you. And uh, <laughs> um, yeah, you can ask me whatever you need to, whatever you want. I, I answer everything. Fish. Um, your book was my. Your book was uh, the film, the book festival's gift to me this year. I don't think I would have ever known about it or read it if it hadn't been part of the book festival. And now I feel you're a gift as well, so thank you very much. You. Um, I love the cover art on the paperback. Could oh. you tell us a little bit about that? This is great, isn't it? This is, a, um, this is a, actually a larger painting. Um, I don't know if I can do this. It's actually a huge canvas. That probably would take up this whole wall. Um, and it's the wolf and the woman, and they're both like in these floral kind of crushed um, it's an artist by the name of Corinna Wolf, um, and she is a Métis right, um, artist who spends half her time in Saskatchewan and half her time in northern Italy just painting. Lucky girl. Um, and this woman's name, she was gifted, and her name is, I'm going to, Sokakakwe, um, which means she stands in strength. Um, <laughs> the funny thing about this is when they first gave me the cover art, like this is a pretty woman heavy book. It's most of the characters are women, women there's one male and basically he kind of flutters around the women and then um, doesn't know what to do and goes and asks his mom. Like it's very, very mom, it's a very mom woman book. So when they gave me the cover art, I said, this guarantees no man is ever gonna pick up this book. We got <laughs> and I'm sorry for it, like she looks so angry. Like originally she's actually quite pale. They gave her some color in her cheeks just to let her look, make her look less intimidating. Um, she's gorgeous. She's absolutely gorgeous. I don't know who she is. Everyone wonders who she might be or the characters. Um, she might be Lou, uh, which is kind of a main protagonist if you can have a main protagonist. Because um, the other teaching I learned, um, the side braid, like the one side braid, um, is traditionally, was traditionally worn by women who were single. Two side braids by women who were married, and a single braid down the back uh, for those, for, for like an elder who was connected to the earth. Um, but the single side braid is a, sing, a single woman. So maybe she's Lu, but Sokakakwe, Sokakakwe. Yeah. But Corinna Wolf is a brilliant artist, if you can find her. She, she has lovely paintings. Uh, 
Um, what was your journey to writing this novel like? Um, did you have kind of failed attempts beforehand? And it's like it was a long journey. <laughs> um, this ju actually, I, I did my MFA my um, in creative writing at UBC um, in Vancouver. And this was originally part of my short story collection, which was a thesis, which was my thesis. Um, and that short story collection had four interconnected stories that were all about a family who experiences, like there's this devastating assault and it's all the different points of view of that assault. Um, and then when I finished, I knew it had to be a novel. I knew I wanted to kind of dive in a little bit more, but I was very fearful of that. Um, so I kind of, I set myself up to um, make myself do that. <laughs> um, and it took about, um, it took a good two years of, of hard work, and that's including with an editor, to really build up around those four stories and build up the larger narrative. Um, because there's so much to say and because I wanted to, um, because whenever I came into a narrative problem or a part that was too dark, I didn't want to see it. I just invented a new character and just started the circle around again. So it became a bit messy. It's not the way I would recommend writing any novel. <laughs> but it, you know, we, we cleaned it up in the end. But it was a really long, hard process. I actually went to, um, I did my, my MFA wanting to know how to write this. Because it was, a, originally it was one short story that, I didn't know how to dive in as much, so I actually went and studied fiction. Um, I'm, a, I'm kind of a, po I've been a poet for many years, but th this is my first, um, one of my first works of fiction. So I really wanted to know how to write it and how to do it justice. So it was a long process. It's been with me for a while. Um, well, I have to, I, I write a lot about, I'm from the North End, which is a, a community in Winnipeg, one of those kind of um, notorious kind of communities. I guess a, a similarity might be the South Side of Chicago, you know, those, they have a lot of stories and everyone kind of goes, oh no, that place. Um, that, that's the kind of community I come from. Um, but actually in the novel, I never mention the words North End or Winnipeg, and I actually did that kind of on purpose because everyone's gonna know who, where I'm talking about, but also because I wanted to give it a, give a little room for fictionalization. These are fictitious people, this is a fictitious incident. Uh, it's of course based on many realities. Um, so the North End is uh, kind of my muse, and my version of it is probably very different than other people's versions of it. It's, uh, we're, we're doing okay. It's a community that's about, on average, 70 to 77% indigenous. Uh, right now in Canada, we have an influx of uh, refugees, particularly in Winnipeg, we have a lot of African refugees over the last 10 years. So those demographics are changing, um, but there's still a very high indigenous population. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge community. There's a lot of everything. We have actually both universities in our city have taken, um, have campuses now in the North End on Selkirk Avenue, which is kind of one of those notorious streets, and everything's changing. So there's a new community campus on both sides of the street. There is um, just a bunch of amazing work that's going on. Um, the Aboriginal Youth Opportunities and Meet Me at the Bell Tower movement, they have this uh, kind of gathering rally every Friday night at six o'clock at this bell tower, uh, where the youth are just really leading this um, movement toward change and uh, reducing violence in the community. Uh, we have something called the Bear Patrol, Bear Clan Patrol, that meets every day at, I think it's like six o'clock or something, and they patrol the neighborhood, com completely volunteer, completely community-led, like things like that are, are always happening. It's a very motivated group of people, um, and, and everything's getting better. Yeah. two-year struggle to write the book. <laughs> yeah. He said, how are you different after your two-year struggle with this book? Um, well, my husband would say I'm a hell of a lot more relaxed. <laughs> um, <laughs> I feel personally relieved. I feel like it's kind of, it's, um, 
Oh, I, uh, I'm sorry, I had a baby six months ago and I keep losing my words. Albatross, that's it. It felt very much like an albatross, for me, uh, my, my literary albatross for a number of years. So just to be able to finish it um, and get through that process, because once you finish a book, then you give it off to the printers and that's the worst time ever, because you want to change everything. Um, so I guess it, was, it wasn't that moment, it was about maybe six months later when I realized um, people weren't going to hunt me down and you know, beat me with sticks for writing such a horrible novel, um, that I, I kind of felt this sense of relief. So I do have a sense of relief. I do feel like it's something that um, I was glad to have written. It was, it's, it was, yeah, it was a good, I don't think I'm going to, I'm not going to write a novel like this again. I think I'm ready to move on. I wasn't ready to move on from it for a really long time. So it was, it was a good catharsis for me, I hope. For everyone. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much.